you. Welcome to Letro 101. Uh, I'm your host, Sister Ritzfire, and today we are going to talk about stats. And we're going to get crunchy today, as some gamers will say. We're going to talk about the things that you will use to make your character better in terms of improving what's most beneficial for your class, and then also what is uh, less beneficial for your class. Like, um, certain classes are like, you know, fighters, you know, in, you know, melee in your face kind of fighters, and they don't necessarily need the stuff that are, um, are not melee people need. So, all right. So our basic stats, all classes will have morale that tells you how healthy you are. Uh, low morale is bad. High morale is good. At least for you, for the bad guys, it's the other way around. Low morale is better. Power, all classes have power except for Bjornings. Bjornings have wrath. So, wrath is basically uh, a determination of how grumpy they are, and it controls their bear form because they're not—they can't always be a bear. Sometimes they have to actually be a person. Uh, everybody has armor. Um, there's a stat that will determine how much armor your character has. Uh, in the game, the number of the armor has very little... Well, it has something to do with what kind of armor you're wearing. Heavy armor classes will have a higher num armor number than lower level classes. Um, the, primary cla uh, the primary stats for the various classes are Might, Agility, Will, and Fate. Might is generally for your heavy armor-wearing classes, such as your Guardians, your Champions, your Bjornings. Uh, agility is for the ones who need to be running around a little bit, like your Burglars, your Hunters. Will is for the ones that are kind of like magic users, even though you're not a magic user uh, at per se, like your Minstrels, your Lore Masters, uh, and your Rune Keepers. And uh, in the character uh, panel that we're going to go look at here in a minute, the tooltip will tell you, you can hover over every stat in the, the thing, and it will tell you whether a stat is important or very important for your class. If it doesn't have one of those two, you don't really need to build for it or look for things that will add to it in a lot of cases, especially on you know landscape content. You just mainly need to focus on the big, the good stuff. The important or very the very important stuff. Um, there are things that are called secondary attributes, which are not visible in the character pane, but you might get gear that will drop that has these on them. And they also there's food that you can eat or uh, snacks that you can, trail foods that you can snack on that can add to your in combat or out of combat morale and power regeneration. Doesn't really help for Bjornings in that case quite so much. Um, they will also tell you about this character panel I'm about to show you will show you things like how much damage you're giving people, how much damage you're taking from people. Uh, there is offense and defense. Um, there is a difference between tactical damage and physical damage. Tactical is, well, it might conjure images of camouflage and, you know, uh, rampaging militias. It's actually more of a case of things like, um, you know, a minstrel doing one of their, uh, one of their cat, you know, one of their attacks and it's like a cry and that does tactical damage or physical damage is, you know, literally your guardian running up and hitting somebody with their, uh, hammer or whatever. Mitigations are more important to our melee fighters for the most part and mitigations help stop, you know, it's like how much of a damage that you're receiving, that you're mitigating, that you're preventing from harming you. And the bad guys also have mitigations of their own that you have to keep in mind. And there's also resistances. It's like, okay, well, this guy tried to poison you. How much are you resisting that poison, for example? Uh, there are caps to various of these statistics. And you do want to keep, in, care, you know, keep them in mind, especially at the higher ends of the gameplay, because there are times that you could actually wind up putting a stat so high that you've capped it and adding more gear that's going to add more to that stat doesn't do you any good and you can maybe focus on something else that isn't at cap. Uh, there's a lot more information about your stats available on this website which is linked in chat 
And let me switch over to the game so I can show you what in the world I am talking about. So this is your character. This is my character. Her name is Phoenix. Uh, this is uh, the main that I ran on the official Lord of the Rings online stream on Friday and wound up streaming an extra three hours because the story was just so good. By the way, speaking of stories, um, today's Tolkien Reading Day. It is also the start of the new Gondorian year because it is March 25th. So those of us who know our lore will know the significance of this day. So these are our stats. Now notice in the, uh, in the screen, by default, you will see something that looks like this, right? Uh, there is this little checkbox up here that says show all stats. We'll give you a lot more information. And this will tell you things like how much morale your character normally has, uh, how much power they have, <clears throat> uh, how much armor they have. And the armor is, as I mentioned, if you hover over something, it'll give you more information in a tooltip. So, for example, if I hover over Will, Will peers down here, it says, as a champion, Will increases your tactical, your tactical mastery, tactical mitigation, and resistance rating. And it says how much uh, that you have that are contributing to those particular stats. Thing is, it says, it doesn't say that it's important. It doesn't say that it's very important. Will is not important to a champion. So I really, as you can see, I haven't put any effort into raising that number. But if you go up to, say, Vitality, well, Vitality is important for any class, right? <clears throat> vitality means the more Vitality you have, the more morale your character has, the harder it is for them to kill, or to be killed, or in this case, defeated, because you don't actually die. <clears throat> and it tells you how easily you recover your morale when you get damaged in some fashion. So, it basically tells you what my character's base vitality is, and all the gear that she is wearing contributes to that vitality as well. However, if I go to Might, it says, as the champion, Might is very important for you. So this tells me that Might is my champion's main stat. This is the, the number one thing you want to focus on and, you know, get all sorted out. Uh, and we mentioned offense and defense. You're going to see things like critical rating. And that's very important for your damage dealing classes. Or even also, it will also tell you the numbers like, how is this affecting your attacks? How is it affecting your skills? So a lot of this stuff is talking about, um, you know, how my character is doing. This won't really tell you so much as which of these four stats are more important for you as a champion. Um, as you can see, the way I've balanced them out, I haven't paid much attention to tactical mastery because... Um, I don't do tactical attacks for the most part as a champion. Other classes, that's their primary mode. So the numbers will be flip-flopped on, say, a minstrel or something like that. <clears throat> so um, there are other things on here called defense. And these are resistances against, um, you know, as a resistance, a, a chance of avoiding all effects. Like if somebody tries to cast a uh, an attack on you and it's like, um, attack that's going to like poison you or something this will help you you know resist that attack or if they're going to try to you know stun you that'll tell you know that'll give you a chance the higher that number is that'll give you a better chance of resisting that attack you know that attempt to stun you um, <clears throat> light of arendil is actually something special that they created for the mordor content so it's a bit higher level so until you get to level 105, you don't really need to worry about Light of Arendelle. And then after that, you'll curse it like the rest of us do. <clears throat> because it's a pain to acquire. Um, other classes uh, will have more like Block, Parry, and Evade. My character cannot block because you have to have a shield to block. Champions cannot wield shields any longer. We used to be able to like 10 plus years ago. Um, I have a Parry. I have an Evade. Um, and they, again, this provides a chance to completely avoid the enemy's attack. Some of these things are similar to the others, but they're kind of like bundled together and some of them, you know, factor in differently. 
I would definitely recommend uh, talking to the theory crafters. Uh, one of the pre uh, preeminent theory crafters in our community is a gentleman by the name of Chromite. Uh, you definitely want to listen to his wisdom in that regard because he generally knows what's what with a lot of this stuff. And this character has no mitigations because I haven't built for mitigations. And you can, of course, use the Lotro Store to uh, increase your abilities in that regard. So this is your basic character panel. Once you've got your character created, you can see all of the gear. And you can hover over each piece of gear to see how it's contributing to your stats. Like, this earring is giving me, you know, over 2,000 might, uh, 25, 65 vitality, you know, 1701 fate. Ooh. That's the number of the Enterprise. Uh, and then tactical mitigation isn't all that important for my character, per se. Uh, so you can hover over everything, and it will tell you how it's contributing to these numbers over here. All of these numbers. It's really cool. All right. What have we got next? And again, this is just an overview of the main stats of the game. Uh, every class has a specialization, so let's we'll move on to our next slide here. <clears throat> so each class has a th uh, color-coded um, specialization. As far as I'm aware, uh, the game hasn't done a lot to make these um, accessible, per se, you know, to those who are visually impaired. But they're color-coded uh, blue, red, and yellow. Blue on the left, red in the middle, yellow on the right. Uh, blue is often the specialist spec, like if your class can be a tank like a guardian, then that's going to be your, the blue is going to be your tanking speci uh, specialization. Healers, then that's going to be the blue. Um, red is also, is generally the maximum DPS. If, if you just want to go in there and lay waste to the world, red is most commonly the way to go. There are some exceptions to that. Uh, yellow is often the support spec. Now, in this case, it's for something like you're doing something to help other classes, like you're you're spending some of your talents to ensure that you're running with other people, that you're helping them out. But uh, there's actually folks who will run in yellow line, and we'll call them red line, blue line, yellow line, um, kind of like the, the London Underground in that regard. Central line is red. Blue line is the... Uh, the Victoria line, I think. Well, that might be gray. Doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> and by default, all accounts will get two slots, slots to specialize their character. Uh, you can buy more with Mithril coin. I'm lazy and haven't. Um, this is also where you can spend something we'll discuss here in a little bit called class trait points. And this is where you can fine tune how your character is going to play. You can spend points in multiple trees in, like, let's say, like, this champion. We're going to show you this window here in a second. This champion is actually uh, primarily red line. That is, that's the specification I chose that I like to play the most, the, the spec. But I spent a lot of my points also in yellow line to pick up a lot of the yellow line abilities because they're cool. Uh, it makes this character um, pretty powerful for, you know, just being a landscape uh, leveled character. Again, you can spend points in both of your off-spec trees, and it's called spec, like you have your, your spec and then you have your off-spec. The off-spec is the one that's like, it's not the one you normally use, but you can use it in the, in, if you want to switch over to it. Or, it's not the one that you're primarily focused on, but you're spending points in one or the other. It's called your off-spec. But, here's the thing, is to try to encourage you to spend your points in your main specification, your specialization, is if you want to spend points in your other trait trees while you're specced into, like, say, red line, you want to spend points in yellow, anything you spend in yellow line will cost two points versus one. And that's the same as if I was in yellow spending points in red, the red ones would be two. <clears throat> now, it didn't used to be this way, but it is now because people abused it. Uh, there is a 30-second cooldown between switching specs. You can switch specs in the middle of anything except active combat. Like, you could be in the middle of a raid, 
You can switch spec before anybody pulls the bus. As long as you're not in combat and your cooldown is up, you can switch spec. It does take a few seconds for the switch to happen. Uh, each spec has skills that are not available to the other specs. Uh, <clears throat> Some of them you can build into, some of them you can't. Some of them are inherent in, like, say, Redline Champion has a couple things that only Redline Champions can do. Uh, each spec has a set of bonus skills and passes available on the left-hand column that we're about to show you that automatically unlock for every five class trait points in that spec. Those bonus skills and passives are free to VIP characters and available to free-to-play premium accounts with a store purchase. So let's go take a look at what that actually looks like. The default key to get to that is the letter J as in Jupiter. So you can kind of see what I'm what I'm what I've done with this character. Um, the bar on the left are the passives that happen that follow along with this, as you can see, the, the shaded arrow pointing down in red line. Because as you see, this again, this may be harder for somebody who's visually impaired. I don't know if they've made this super accessible, but uh, in this case, the Berserker is, and you can highlight the name, it will tell you what it does. Because once you get to a care, once you, you can start selecting your spec, I think it's at level five. I think it changed, it used to be at level 10, but I think it's level five now. Where you can select your spec, and then you can switch to your off spec, you know, by clicking the little tab over here. Right, but if you highlight the name, it will tell you basically the the base nature of that spec. So the, the Berserker for Champion, for example, says it deals single target crit based melee damage, and it says how much how many points I've put into that. The Deadly Storm says deals whirling AOE destruction upon foes. Uh, and then Martial Champion, which used to be the uh, Champion tanking spec, it kind of still is, but Champions are not well liked as tanks because we, we don't have, um, we don't really have shields anymore, so it's much harder. So even though that's the case, it does say that this is the damage soaking tank who prefers offense over defense. So these uh, traits down the down the side, I've unlocked them because I've spent enough points here in my red line that this is all the way down and these are all unlocked. On a free-to-play or premium account, unless you've unlocked each of these, they will have the uh, Lotro points, the, ter the standing stone logo for Lotro points on there, the little coin. So this basically tells you, you know, this increases your power regen, this... Uh, some of them are a set bonus. Uh, some of them... Uh, <clears throat> like this one will improve uh, Remorseless Strike, which is one of the champion skills that makes it more powerful. It's really cool. Go all the way down here. And they these automatically equip. You don't have to do anything with these. These, some of them are passive skills. And then, like, this one, Deadly Strikes, is a passive skill. And it gives me, you know, 25% critical damage. But I need to have, like, in this case, um, Brutal Strikes. This one is an actual skill. Like, if I choose this, I get something to use down here on my click slot bars. In fact, where is it hiding? It's right here. Brutal Strikes. I like Brutal Strikes. So one of my favorites, of course, is Devastating Strike. That's my favorite. Okay, so that is the basics of your trait tree. Now, let's say you go through all of this. I have points available. I can spend them anywhere I want. Um, I don't really like all of the things. Like, I should put points in attack duration. I, I, I don't want to build for that. Let's say I want to add more, I want more AOE, I can do that. Or I can choose Great Cleave, which is an actual skill. Uh, that basically means all of my AOE skills uh, take less of my, it's, champions have this thing called Fervor that builds up over time. Or if you use a skill that adds to the Fervor, 
So I'm thinking Great Cleave and I are going to be good friends. So we're going to pick Great Cleave. Now, by clicking on this thing, it temporarily, it like potentially selects it. But until you actually click apply, you can cancel and go back and spend your points wherever you're eligible to spend your points. Now, let's say you've gone in and you've applied it and you've said, yes, I do want to commit these trait changes. But then you decide, well, you know what? I really didn't want to do that. You can click the respecialize button and it will tell you how much it costs. Now, the thing is, the more times you respecialize, the more money it costs. So choose wisely before you click apply so you don't have to hit the respecialize button too often. Uh, you can add additional specs if you want to with Mithril Coin. Again, I don't feel the need. Uh, most of my classes, I generally only play one spec anyway because I'm boring that way. All right. So that's specs, specializations. All right. What's next? Class trait points. We talked about those. Class trait points. Uh, let me give you the slide for this. Mainly, how, how do you get class trait points? Is you earn them through leveling up. Certain times you hit a certain level, you'll automatically get a class trait point. Like you hit level 120 or you hit level 130. Um, certain landscape quests will grant you a class trait point. Uh, there are a lot of deeds that will do that. And um, those are really cool because all you have to do is play the game, get class trait points. Uh, completing certain class quests available at levels 39, 45, and 58. Uh, the 39 one generally appears when you're running around uh, the Misty Mountains. Same with the level 45 stuff. Misty Mountains, Forchel, and Angmar is generally where you're going to wind up doing those. 58 is in Moria. Uh, completing specific chapters of the Epic Quest in the Black Book of Mordor will also grant you trait, uh, class trait points. Uh, there is a really cool um, plug-in called Class Rate Points, actually, by Thrawler, uh that can help you keep track of them, but it's not an automated thing except for the ones that are done by level. So you also can earn two Class Rate Points by getting 100 and 200 promotion points in the Epic and Big Battles, as we have mentioned in previous classes. Uh, also using certain class skills a specific number of times will grant you a class trait point. Um, there's like, you do three particular skills, you fill up their bars, and then you do all three of them. It's like a meta deed, and then you can get the class trait point. It's like a tier one, tier two, tier three. And also, if you earn kindred reputation with the Air Iron Garrison Guards in Moria, you can spend a little gold, buy a book from the vendor, and get a class trait point. Uh, so let's discuss those happy things. Those aren't it. Those aren't it either. So how do you track your class trait points? And that's actually a little bit difficult. They don't have a place to tell you so much. Let me shoot back the game here. Is they'll tell you how many points you have available and how many you've spent on this particular screen. But they don't really do a lot to tell you which ones you're missing and where to go get them. Because a lot of these, we're going to pull up our deed log with Shift L by default. We go down here to the class deeds, and it says, Well, I completed this deed, I completed that deed, I completed this third deed. My reward is a class trait point. A lot of these class deeds are hidden until you activate them. So the first time you, you know, did a skill like um eeny meeny miny mo pick one um deep strikes first time i hit uh critically hit an enemy with one of these particular skills this deed appears and then once i complete the deed then one of these metas show up and say oh hey you have you know, you've completed Deadly Strikes, therefore I'll show you this, this meta D that you can do. And then you go see, oh, hey, I have to do these other two as well. Um, it can be annoying to do these. Uh, one way to get around them is by boosting your character with either the 105 or the 120 Valors. You do not automatically get your class deeds completed or the points for them 
if you um, get the lower Valors. And the Valor is a character boost that lets you automatically boost your character. You can buy them in the store. They're pretty expensive. Not recommended for new players. In fact, I spent about a year telling our community manager, no, Jerry, don't do this because you probably need to learn to play the game a bit more. I guess he came from the other game, so he didn't know as much about it as we do. So it's all good. So these are your class traits. And... Again, you can also earn them, as I said, through the epic quest. Not the reputation one, the epic. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. You can complete all six books in Minds of Moria Part 1. You get a class rate point. You complete Allies of the King. You don't get a class rate point. Minds of Moria Part 2. You don't get a class rate point. Trying to find one that gives you a class rate point, and I'm having trouble. Well, there's a lot of them. Actually, <clears throat> oh, they don't listen to me, Stege. <laughs> if they did, the 120 dollars would be so much better than they are. <laughs> All right. There's a couple of different ways to grind your class trait points, because one of the things to be cautious of is, uh, let's go back to these. Let's pick this. It's yellow. Thing is, most of these use your skill class rate point deeds will only let you grind or use it so many times in one single day. Like, And there's a different amount. It's not the same amount for every skill because some skills you're going to use more often than others. So I remember having to grind one of them on my minstrel, which required my minstrel to resurrect somebody or, you know, to, uh, to revive them. And that was a pain in the rear end because I had to recruit my friend Catriana, who is a good friend of Signum University. Um, and in fact was supposed to be one of the speakers at uh, Sunshine Moot. So we're all looking forward to the, uh, uh, un whenever the new Sunshine Moot's going to be. <clears throat> and we'd have her go to a place of known death, of sure death, sudden death, sudden sure death, and her character would uh, be defeated, and then I would use my my resurrecting ability on her. We did this over and over again until we realized, oh, wait a minute. Why don't we use something called a uh, a uh, a skill or Slayer Deed Boost. You can buy them in the Lotro store. Uh, let me see if I have any. Apparently I have some in my own inventory right here. So. It's one of these books. It's called a, skill, a Slayer and Skill Deed Boost. Sometimes you'll see just a Slayer uh, Deed Boost. So you want to be careful. You, it needs to say Skill. Otherwise, it's not going to work. When you hit one of those bad boys, there's two things that's going to happen. Uh, one is anytime you use that particular skill, it'll go twice because it's accelerated. Plus, while it's still uh, buffed on you because it, it gives you a buff, you can use that skill repeatedly because it's basically standing so and saying, well, you spent money on this because these are a store purchase and lets you go to certain places and just you know, wail on people, like a target dummy in the Etten Moors, the PvP zone, um, you can go there and stay in your base and not actually go out to PvP and just stand there and hit the training dummy. Uh, in fact, uh, can I do that from here? No, I actually am not going to, but uh, you can do that and the bar won't go yellow. That's the quick way to grind through those pretty fast uh, and not have to worry about um, um, imposing on a fellow player to help you out with the ones that require another player. Uh, it's particularly pernicious on healers. And yes, you can get Slayer Deeds, or I'm sorry, Skill Deed, uh, those tomes, in the Hobbit Presence. In fact, that's where I got most of mine. I don't think... I only bought them off the store like once. And they're fairly... Fairly good Hobbit present reward. Let me go see. 
Um, accelerators. It's under the boosts and buff thing. So you don't have to roll really, really good to get it. But it's a gold roll. So anyway. Alright, what is next? So that's class trait points. And racial traits. Let's go... Um, let's do the slide first and then we'll actually show you. I like to tell and then show. So racial traits are available at starting at level 13. Uh, each race has nine traits to earn. A maximum of five total can be slotted at once. So you have to pick and choose which ones best meet your needs at that given time. And they're not the same for every race. Uh, all five slots are unlocked for VIP, available for purchase by free-to-play and premium. If a player goes... And this is actually really cool. This is one of the perks you get if you were VIP and, and you know could not maintain um, that membership. If a player goes VIP for even a single month, all five of them unlock and stay unlocked if you uh, cancel your subscription or, you know, have to for whatever reason. Uh, you earn these uh, by achieving certain levels, completing specific deeds often associated with killing mobs and the oldest content in game. The Arid Lewin Slayer deeds are your best friend or achieving a specific reputation with a, a certain faction. These rewards can include things like a passive bonus to your damage, Certain combat skills, like uh, old school doors, get a headbutt that I find terribly fun. It, it's not useful at higher levels of the game. I don't care. It's so much fun, the headbutt bosses. Uh, you can get some travel skills, like traveling to Rivendell or whatever, and some passive bonuses to your stats. And, for example, if you play a high elf, one of the, your possible racial unlocks is being able to res your fellow players. I was once running with Cordovan uh, in Moria. He was playing a dwarf minstrel who should have been able to heal himself, but he was playing a minstrel tank for some stupid reason. And I was playing a hunter. Hunters are not a healing class. <clears throat> and his character died, and because I was a high elf hunter, I used my high elf racial skill and resurrected him. It's really cool. So let's go take a look at what that looks like in-game. <clears throat> it's also accessed through the same trait panel that we've been looking at with the, the character J. Unless you change it. And then what you do is you go to the left-hand side and you click the little person. Uh, so this is what a regular elf's panel looks like. It, this is the art is different for each, each race. <clears throat> and I have them all unlocked because I've played this character forever, and these are the five that I have chosen to slot. So, for example, this is Tactics in Conviction bonus, which helps if you're running in groups. Uh, this is a one-handed sword damage bonus. This is really good because I'm playing a champion. So that's 5% additional damage uh, that another race may not have. Ooh, Bookworm got a symbol of the Elder King and a silver present? Nice. Also, because champions can wield bows, the bow damage is also good. Um, I could add a large number to my character's fate stat. I don't use that one quite so much because fate's not that important to a champion. Uh, and I preferred using some of the other things, like there's a... There's a a stealth thing you can do. There's a thing, an improvement of various virtues, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, this is something that I can, this is a skill that I can use to give myself uh, a good parry chance and get a little parry mitigation that's very helpful in avoiding some damage. Uh, the return to Rivendell is a skill that helps me, you know, basically I can teleport to Rivendell once an hour. It's very handy if you don't have a milestone set there. Or the power of the Eldar, which will grant both you and people in your party, your fellowship, within 20 meters, plus 5% maximum power. And that's got a 10-minute cooldown. Well, no, it lasts for 10 minutes, but it's got a 30-minute cooldown. So these are the ones I, you know, I have these five slotted. And you can switch these out anywhere. It's not that big of a deal. You can unslot them, reslot them, no big deal. Um, <clears throat> some classes, some people choose a class based on these particular race traits. 
Um, for example, as a champion, the two elven damage ones the, for the one-handed sword and the bows are really helpful. Um, a guardian would be a good class to use those with as well. Not so much a, um, for example, a bow. Bow damage is not going to be useful if you're playing like um, a rune keeper. An elven rune keeper doesn't wield a bow, so th that does you no good. So people can mix and match them however they choose for flavor. All right. What is next? We mentioned virtues, so let's go slide for just a second. Virtues are a little bit of your bread and butter. They recently, last year, was it either last year or late the previous year, they overhauled virtues, made it look pretty, and did something really, really cool. Just as a small historical note, um, it used to be where if you did certain old school deeds like Arid Lewin in the starting areas, it gave you a specific virtue reward. Like you just leveled up this particular virtue to another, you know, to another tier. And it was a pain in the rear end because a lot of people like, well, I don't want to do that deed because I don't need that virtue for my class. Like they know which ones they want to use. And so it was a bit tedious. So what they did is they overhauled the system and made it, they added a, a new virtue called wit. Uh, that can be useful for just about any class. They also made it so that as you go through quests, anything that would normally have earned you a specific upgrade of a virtue it will grant you virtue points instead. And then you can select where it goes, but you have to select where it goes before you acquire the points. Otherwise, it's going to go someplace you don't intend. However, until that point, let's uh, you get five slots. These are unlocked between level 7 and 23. You can select one virtue to be the one that you're going to earn points in, and any incoming virtue XP will apply to leveling that specific one of your choice until you change which one you want it to be. Virtues currently cap at rank 68. That just changed a couple weeks ago. Uh, any extra virtue XP, we call it VXP, upon hitting that cap in the earning virtue, like if you have the, if you cap out the one that you have selected as earning at rank 68, then the XP will automatically transfer, the extra XP will go to the first slotted virtue that isn't capped. And then if all five of those are at cap because you're really awesome like Chromite, uh, then it will go to the next one that's not slotted uh, until all of them are capped. Virtue XP is accrued through completing various deeds throughout the game, certain festival events, and as a reward for every single Hobbit present roll, you'll get a little vial of Virtue XP. It's really cool. Uh, you can also get accelerators in the Lotro store, and I've seen them floating around the game. Uh, each Virtue provides three passive stats, with the first one being the most uh, intense of the three and have either a sword or a shield icon to indicate which version of Pokemon you're playing. Wait, that's a Tuesday class. <laughs> no, it actually indicates whether they're offensive or defensive. Um, all virtues provide a passive stat bonus, even if they're not the ones you're selected as your slotted stats, uh, so that you, if you want to maximize, uh, get all the seasoning on your character and max everything out, uh, you continue to do all the game content, be a completionist if you must, and you earn all that VXP until you have all of them maxed out, and then it looks really cool. Uh, I'm going to drop the link for the wiki page on Virtues in chat. If you haven't been to that page, it's full of really awesome. Also, Bookworm does mention uh, an important thing is when you're a lower level character, your Virtues will cap at a lower number than 68. So... You'll want to keep an eye on that. Because as you level up, your virtue level cap will also go up as well. So I'm on a max level character. So when you when we take a look here at my virtues, you'll see them <coughs> with a highest level of 68. But I don't think I have anything at 68. So let's switch over to the game. And you're going to click this little eagle icon over here. And this is our virtue panel. So I have the five up here that are the ones from down here. You can see which ones have the fancier logo around them. The, the, little, the little, well, it's not 
that's not Celtic knot work, but it's kind of in that uh, sort of thing. And the, the filigree, we'll call it filigree. So you can see which five I've chosen. Chromite, don't take a look at this, this is bad. Um, and right now, as you can see, not only do I have wit selected up here as a slotted item, I also have it selected as earning. You can see the green word earning there. Uh, and also, you can hover over each one. It will tell you what it will do uh, in terms of these are the stats this thing will provide to your character, and this is the passive bonus that you're getting. You get a passive bonus on every single one of these, regardless of whether it's slotted or unslotted. So that's why you'd want to grind the content to go through all, you know, to get all this done because you're going to do better for your character. <coughs> Another thing is like your um, specs, you get as many uh, virtue uh, unlocks as you get spec unlocks. So if you've gone over here and dropped some mithril coin to unlock more specs, you can have more, uh, more customized virtue traits. However, here's the key. This tab, tab one, tab two, corresponds to the same tab over here, one or two. So you're going to want to build your virtues to take your spec into account. So Standing Stone figured, well, if I'm on spec one, which I'll switch my character over to my first spec, mainly yellow line with a sprinkle of uh, blue line and a little sprinkle of, of red line. So this is more of a more of a, I'm really spending most of my points in one of my specs than the other two. I need to spend some points while I'm at it. <clears throat> but as you can see, I've spent all of the points possible in yellow line, so. Power restore, tactical mitt, uh, repost damage, ooh, that sounds like a goodie. And one of the things you can notice, by the way, in terms of your class traits, you don't have to go down the line necessarily. A lot of the things clearly require you to have, you know, you can't unlock this one without having, you know, unlock that one. Or some of them may not lock, unlock the ones below them until you've maxed out the one above them. But for the most part, um, you, can, you can navigate around as long as it's unlocked. So, you know, I'm going to do that later. But you notice my traits are very different over here in my yellow line spec. I don't even have wit select. I don't even have wit slotted, but I have these other ones here. And you notice this, the shield and the sword icons, the red sword and the blue shield. So what these are, uh, each one, it tells you which one are you on. The left hand number is the, the level you are right now of that virtue. The right hand one is the next level, and if it caps, it will tell you. You notice uh, tolerance here is set to 30. I'm at level 34. My max level for this is 68, so you want to keep an eye on that if you're a lower level character. And it tells you how much virtue you need for the next rank, and also where you are in overall, like, you know, 34 of 68. This is what this, the, the gold bar is for. So that's really cool. I forgot to hit enter on that. Durr. There we go. There's the virtue thing. All right. So that's an overview of virtue experience. Um, and again, you can buy virtue experience accelerates in the Lodra store if you want. Um, I think the quickest way to get your virtues leveled up is A, level your character, and B, do all of the content. All of it. Every single bit of it. All right, what's next? What's next, precious? Gear. Oh, okay. So gear is basically the real bread and butter of whether your character is going to live or die. Uh, equipment with stats is attached to... Okay, equipment with... Basically, gear refers to equipment with stats that are attached to improve your character's abilities. Um, you can acquire gear by completing quests, defeating foes, looting chests, backpacks, corpses... Yes, looting people's corpses is a thing in Lotro. Running instances, crafting, pickpocketing if you're a burglar. Opening loot boxes, which is uh, money, money, money. So we, buyer beware. Um, so there's a lot of ways to acquire gear. You can also trade with your fellow players 
for certain gear. Remember how we talked in an earlier class about the binding of items? Uh, some items are bound to your account. You can't trade that to another player, but perhaps you can trade it to one of your alternate characters. Yeah. But you can also trade certain unbound items with anybody. It doesn't matter. This includes pieces of armor, jewelry, and you notice I'm using the, uh, the Tolkien or the game spelling for this. There's a pocket item. Some of us wish there were two pocket items. Uh, one or more weapons, including shields or bows, uh, a crafting tool, and a class item. Gear has a scale of rarity, much like um, using... Not the same rarity colors. This is different from the colors of quests or of the mobs that you're going to be fighting. Uh, these will be... Uh, common gear will be white in terms of their nameplate. Uh, uncommon is yellow. That's a lot of the stuff you're going to find is going to be yellow gear, right? Um, there is... Well, uncommon is actually also um, stuff that if you're crafting, the default is that it's going to be a yellow item. You're, never gonna, you're rarely going to craft a common item. Uh, a rare is a purple item, purple... The, the nameplate is purple. Uh, incomparable is Scion. Don't ever call it teal. You might hear people refer to Scions or purples or teals. They are never teals, okay? Never teals. And there's actually somebody I see who posts frequently on the forums. Their forum signature says, this is Scion and with a color code, you know, the right color. And then this is teal and uses a different color of their text and, you know, learn to tell the difference. Because there's no such thing as teal gear in the game. <laughs> um, armor is either light armor, medium armor, or heavy armor. And each class has a limit to what kinds of armor it can equip. A minstrel can only wear light armor. A champion can wear light, medium, or heavy armor. Though it, by default, will want to use heavy armor because you get more uh, protection from it. Weapons are also limited in terms of which class can wield which items. For example, lore masters are the only class in game that can wield a staff. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, certain classes will unlock more weapon types as they level up. For example, eight, speaking of our lore master, when they hit level 40, they can also equip a sword as their offhand, which is really cool to see because Gandalf went sword and staff because he's Gandalf and lore master is kind of like Gandalf super light uh, gear can wear out over time of, with accessories so if you keep getting hit your gear will wear out and then you'll get a little icon on your screen like a paper doll of your character with the piece of you know which which slot uh, is actually the one it'll be yellow if you're getting close to it wearing out or it'll be red if it's actually completely broken and it will actually unequip. So you can't actually use it or take advantage of it. And that's important. Repairing your gear is important because if it gets broken and you can't use it, you can't take advantage of the stats attached to it. But you can repair uh, your gear with silver at many vendors, including your vault keepers. Well, no, I lied. Your vault keepers can't repair your gear. But provisioners and suppliers are good ones uh, to repair gear. Or you can do it with Mithril Coin at any time. But again, that's real money. Gear can also be used as cosmetics. And many pieces will still take dyes. In fact, uh, we showed that off on a previous class when we went over the wardrobe system. Uh, and the cool thing about Lotro's wardrobe system, besides the fact that you can dye stuff, is that if your character can't wear heavy armor... But you like that real, you like the look of that heavy armor, your character can cosmetically equip it. They can't take advantage of the stats. They're not actually using it, they just look it. Really awesome. So let's take a quick look at the gear my character is wearing right now. Get that out of the way. So, for example, she's wearing this tunic, which you can see the tunic, what it actually looks like right there. And these are the stats that are attached to it. The stats will include an item level, which has nothing to do with your character level, what kind of armor it is, and you notice it's a yellow, the yellow, it's a yellow name, so it's an uncommon item. 
And whereas the, the gloves she has are a purple or a rare item. They're not so rare. You just go do the quest and you get them. And it tells you how much armor it gives you and what the stats are. And those stats can vary. Some of them may not make sense. Um, for example, heavy armor with will on it's not that important anymore. Um, it used to be a long time ago uh, captains needed that, but it's not that big deal. It will also tell you... Um, after the green stats, it'll also tell you how much it's worn out. It'll tell you the maximum amount of damage. You know, it's like if it's 65 of 65, then it's in pristine condition. If it gets down to zero, then it's broken. Uh, it starts acting that it's worn out if it gets below 10. So nine or lower, it will be yellow until it hits zero, and then it'll be red, and it'll be broken, and it'll unequip. It'll also tell you next to this, see normal, tough, or substantial, or something like that. That just basically gives you an idea of how quickly that durability will go down. So something that's tough, even if it has 65 points of durability, it will wear out more slowly than something that says it's normal. Uh, there's also a couple of stats like inferior or whatever, and it'll it basically it'll break if you sneeze on it. Uh, some items will also mention a minimum level, which means you can't equip that item until you hit that specific level. Uh, a lot of quest gear may not show a minimum level, but it might actually have one. Uh, but in general terms, if you complete a quest that's up to red, so it's less than eight levels, no, up, up to eight levels above you, you can still equip but some of it may be, you know, you receive this item, but you're too low level to equip it. So sometimes you'll get a piece of armor or whatever that you can't use for a couple of levels. Especially if you're running harder and harder content uh, than you normally would because you've got friends. So that's pretty much the basics of gear. Um, <clears throat> and again, you'll want to keep an eye on like might, vitality, physical master rating. You want to keep an eye on which stats are important to your class versus which gear you have. In general terms, when the game, when you're doing a quest in the game, the game will often offer an item that's suitable for heavy armor users, an item for medium armor users, and then an item for um, a light armor users. Sometimes you're going to get quest rewards where there's something that's set in one of those, but the stats on it aren't better than what you already have, or they're not fine-tuned to your class. Because part of the problem is there's more than one class that has Might as their primary stat. There's Guardians. There's Bjornings. Um, so there might be a piece of gear that drops that might be better for somebody playing a Guardian tank than a DPS champion. And we'll talk about tank versus guard, uh, DPS versus... Um, heals here in a little bit that is part of our lesson so let's go back to our slides moving on moving on Boop. legendary item will be the bane of your existence in lord of the rings online it is for everybody else including the developers um <clears throat> they were a really great idea at first sort of and uh they went weird but they're still important to the game and it's important and it's important for you to learn the basics of how they work because you will need them in later uh, editions. Like, a lot of the current content of the game, you need a legendary item. You need to have spent the time and the effort to, you know, make that legendary item better. So I'm not going to profess to know the ins and outs of allies. I highly recommend talking to folks like Chromite, the theory crafters, because they will know what is better for a class and which, you know, which features you might want to look for. First available upon beginning the Mines of Moria content around level 50. Uh, LIs, as they are called, are designated. There's three different kinds of LIs. There are Third Age LIs, which are purple. And even though technically that counts as rare, they're not so rare. A lot of people just get them and throw them away or they filter them. There are Second Age LIs, which are our Scions. Also known as incomparable gear, or you're going to get your first age or uh, allies, which are gold in name and called epic. And the older it is, the 
uh, better stats you're going to get. And with certain items, such as uh, two-handed uh, swords and two-handed um, clubs of, and hammers and such, you're going to get certain passives attached to them. Um, and there are some that are better than others. <clears throat> Before you can equip an ally, you must identify it first. And here's where things get complicated. Because there is a list of stats, both passive and active, that can be assigned to them. These active stats are called legacies. Uh, every class has a weapon for an ally and a class item. Other than hunters who get a bow and a sword. Why minstrels didn't get... A legendary uh, musical instrument. I have no idea. <clears throat> but uh, it is what it is. Uh, allies level up. Or can be leveled up. Uh, by You can earn it directly through quests. You can also get dropped or buy uh, legendary item XP runes. Um, do I have any in my inventory? I don't think I do right at the moment. No. Actually, I lied. I do have a couple, so let me pop over to gameplay for just a second. And these are an L.I. rune. Not the Tuppen skins, but let's touch on this and touch on that. So these are two different runes that I have. A lot of runes will bind to account. You pretty much can't sell them to anybody else. You can share them amongst your alts if you want to. And as it says, requires minimum level of 50 and requires Seeker of Deep Places, which basically means you've completed the intro quest to get into Moria. Um, and it tells you how much, uh, how much you're going to get for using one of those runes. So let's say I wanted to use one. I'm going to right click. And it's going to show you which items are eligible to add it to. And I have a first age legendary item that's red here in the tooltip or in the, the thing because it's actually broken. I haven't repaired it because I don't have it equipped right now. <clears throat> and fortunately, the names will also tell you what age it is. So if you see in over there, you see the name Rooney. It's in gold. That is a first age uh, relic, or I'm sorry, a uh, captain's M a champion's rune. Sorry. So Rooney is my champion's rune. Uh, it's one of them, but it's the first ager. But it's also you can see the durability. It's in red. It says zero because I let it get broken because I didn't care because I'm I'm not equipping it until I get the stats more in line with the third ager I have. All right. So one of the cool things is if you have a stack of these runes, these uh, XP runes right here, you can use this slider up here to use one or up to the maximum number of your stack to add to that. So let's say I want to apply it, so I click Rooney. If I had any other eligible items to use this on, they would appear here, but right now I don't. So we're going to apply that pile of XP to that item and we're gonna do the same to the other one right click choose the item and use the slider and this is only gonna be 2000 so it's not that big of a deal alright back to the slide for just a minute then we'll go play with this a little bit more uh, allies have uh, class specific legacies that tie into your character's abilities things that will do things like as a champion you get a skill called bracing heal there is a legacy that makes Bracing Heal better. Uh, some legacies are better than others for each spec. The wiki is not too helpful on this. There are guides out there, uh, you know, guides to legendary items. I mean, Dottie uh, is a gentleman who makes various guides, and you might want to go check on his website, dottieslotroguides.com, I believe it is. I'm going to see if I can find it. One of the other downsides is sometimes these guides can be out of date. Uh, Alright. Dottie's Lotro guides. 
Yeah, Dottie'sLetroGuides.com is a good place for a lot of uh, player guides as well. So let me drop that in Twitch chat real quick. I do believe he does have one for allies as well. All right. Uh, it's better to change the legacies of an LI because guess what? You're going to get, you're going to identify an LI and the legacies are going to stink for your class or the play style that you're trying to do. Like you get something that'll be good for a blue line hunter, but you want to be a red line hunter because they do the maximum amount of damage and they can shoot their bows from furthest away. Um, <coughs> so there's like... You want to max out Heart Seeker, which is one of the premier Redline Hunter skills. Well, there is a legacy for that. But let's say your bow doesn't identify with Heart Seeker. I was like, well, that's what I want. So you can use things um, called. You can use things called a legacy replacement scroll. You, you can find them in certain quests. Uh, not too many of them. Uh, they do drop rarely from mobs. Um, they, you can also buy them on the Lotro store. Uh, <clears throat> however, it's basically you want to adjust your legacies as soon as you get the thing and decide that it's not any good. Or maybe only one or two of the legacies are going to work for you. You switch the others out. And as your item progresses with you, every 10 levels you have to reforge it. And if you reforge it and it adds another legacy and it's still a, it's a bad legacy, you want to swap it out right then and there. That way, as you continue to level, you're leveling the right legacy. And the reason why you want to do that is because when you swap legacies out, you don't get a 100%, you know, a one-to-one -one return on that investment. So let's say you leveled an ally with the wrong legacy for... 55 levels out of 60 and you decide you want to switch that legacy out you got to start your new legacy at one so change out the legacies first and then start leveling stuff up uh, you can upgrade your allies by reforging them uh, through things called scrolls of delving which can add uh, more levels to your item Starlit Crystals, you'll hear them both blessed and cursed in terms of players. You can get them through various uh, means, through like grinding certain festivals. Like we talked about festivals last time, and how you could get Starlit Crystals if you do like the meta or you do a lot of that festival and then you go to the barter and say, hey, I want a Starlit Crystal and they'll give you one. <clears throat> uh, you can also get Crystals of Remembrance. I actually generally wind up getting those through Hobbit presents a lot. Crystals will remember show up a lot in my Hobbit presents. And also you can get Scrolls of Empowerment and those will also be the bane of your existence, getting Scrolls of Empowerment because there's not a lot of content that gives you scrolls, but you need a ton of them because of the next thing, which is imbuement. At level 100 of your character, once you hit level 100, you will then be eligible to imbue your legendary items. There are several things you're going to want to do before you imbue your item. Um, for one thing, uh, you want to make sure you have maxed everything out before you're done. Got the right legacies first, maxed them out, added three starlit crystals to that bad boy to upgrade it, done your scroll of delving to add an additional 10 levels, um, you know, do what you got to do to max that puppy out so it's ready to go bursting at the seams and then you imbue it because you can imbue your stuff wrong. And I think that's part of Dottie's guide and I believe folks like uh, Chromite, and again, I'm not volunteering Chromite for anything, but he is definitely a good source of information. <clears throat> One of the cool things about allies is that you can use them as cosmetics. Hey, Ginger, welcome. So any LI can be used as a, a cosmetic as long as it's a visible LI, like um, your weapons, like a staff. Let's say you find a really cool um, staff as an LI, but you may not be able to equip it yet. 
Well, you can use it as a, uh, you can use it as a cosmetic. The only, um, things you can't use as cosmetics in terms of allies is, for some reason, the game won't let you cosmetically equip an offhand item, because allies will always go into either your primary hand, I, I just did the Vulcan salute, sorry, so this is my primary hand, this is my right hand, so let me, let me make it, and actually this works better. So in your main hand, you can cosmetically equip your ally there. It still applies to the, the restrictions on weapons and cosmetics still apply. For example, you can't cosmetically equip a great sword, a two-handed weapon, over a one-handed sword. But um, you can use, for example, any one of your one-handed sword allies on any one of your main hand swords. So it's not so cool for like burglars who are gonna, you know, dual wield daggers or whatnot. So I never use the ally for a character that's gonna dual wield weapons just because it's a thing. I, I like symmetry in that regard. So let's go take a quick look at allies. Here, we're gonna go back in game. So. We're gonna show you what a, uh, an ally looks like. Uh, you can access the ally screen with shift I is the default. And you can start off with, I believe, six slots of things that you can slot as an ally. Uh, so right here, I actually have a bridle for my war steed. You can equip, uh, there, there are allies available for war steed bridles at level 75 and higher. Um, you can, yes, I named it Ashbringer because I'm a dork. So I want to show you the example of something. Okay, we'll, we'll use this. This is what an ally will look like if it's, not imbued. This is what the screen looks like. Because this is the thing, when they changed the system at level 100, they didn't wipe away the old system. They just kind of added on to it. Made a little bit of spaghetti there. So this is a great sword item that I picked up. And I was like, you know what? I might build another first age ally. How am I going to do that? Well, I need an item that's got the legacies that I want. So <clears throat> there's a couple of different things about these legacies uh, and the uh, the thing here. Firstly, you can rename your item with this little little thing right here, this little um, quill. You can do that anytime. The upgrades, these are where you add starlit crystals to your item and these three stars will light up. Uh, this tells me this item is maxed out. It's level 60 of 60. You can only add levels to your item once, to level 70. And you can also track these things. You click the little track button and it appears over there. And so every item starts with the primary damage stat or healing stat. And it's right here. And when you level an ally, this is the first one you put points in. You can rank up. You see I have so many points available. But right here, it won't let me add any because it's already at maximum rank. Uh, it'll tell you how many points down here that you have before you can get the next one. So I could technically rank this one up if I wanted to. This tells me how many I've already spent. <clears throat> so you want to rank this thing up first, max it out, and then start looking at your legacies down here. These are the legacies assigned to this item. By default, it starts with like two or three, and then as you level up, as you reforge the item every ten levels, you then add another legacy to it, or you improve an existing legacy. You can also customize your allies through these bad boys over here. Now these are, these match to these things down here. So you can get settings. You can get settings through certain quests. You can craft them. Um, there are gems that you can craft or acquire through quests. There are runes. And then you can, you know, there's ones that are actually called just crafting. And this one doesn't have any slotted. 
because this is a piece that I have set sitting aside uh, because I was doing something with it and I forget what it was. And here it is something, let's go take a look at a weapon that has been imbued. So you see there's no place to upgrade with Starlit Crystals that it says here, but you, but this item can still be upgraded. So this is my primary damage legacy, and these are my other legacies. And this one has uh, runes assigned to it, the relics, they're called. Uh, so I have one of these, one of these, one of these. And apparently I'm using the... On this item, I am currently using the ones that I got with the Purchase of Mordor. You also, uh, if you buy the Mordor expansion in the cash shop, the cash website, not the in-game store, or Minas Morgul through the cash website, not the in-game store, you get a set of relics for every character on your account. It's really neat. And relics have tiers. Um, I don't know how high they go, quite frankly. It starts with tier 1. Uh, it might go to tier 10, all these. And they have minimum levels of what you can, you know, use. A lot of them don't really care. <clears throat> Part of the problem of doing this on a max level character is you can't see all the cool stuff. So you can change out your relics a couple of different ways. Um, one of the other ways you can change them out is with a relic removal scroll. Um... <clears throat> And you can also replace Legacy. But you need an, an a Legacy Replacement Scroll. Now, there's also an Imbued Legacy Replacement Scroll, which is what I would have to use on this item because it's Imbued. Now, the thing about that, you can also spend Mithril Coin. Any of this stuff is monetized. If you wanted to spend the money on it, you can. I don't suggest necessarily doing that unless you're really desperate. <clears throat> and it will tell you what legacies are available for your class and also for stats. For the most part, most, most of you won't actually want to use any of the stats to replace any of these because you want to focus on, you know, like this one right here, Ferocious Strikes Cooldown, Ferocious Strikes Damage, or Rend Bleed Damage would be a good one right now because I switched my, my spec over to Yellow Line. I'm going to remind myself to put it back on red line. <clears throat> so you can switch these out. They do cost a little bit or you get the scroll. You can get in. Actually, you can also. I've been collecting legacy replacement scrolls, imbued legacy replacement scrolls through Hobbit Presence. So that's where I'm getting my stash of those. <clears throat> so the thing is why you'd want to change out your legacy before you imbue. It's very punishing to switch out your legacies after you imbue. Also, the legacies aren't one-to-one -one the same before and after imbuement. Some of them change names. Some of them change entirely. There is a guide on the wiki uh, about that. Let me see if I can find it real quick because I don't have it listed here. <clears throat> but still, having that list on the wiki of which legacy goes where doesn't tell you necessarily which is good and which is bad for your class. So that's definitely something you want to keep an eye on. This is also something where you'll want to listen to folks who are more learned about this than I am. Again, folks like uh, Chromite's a good person to talk to if he's amenable. He's also a very busy person, so. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, some allies can be crafted by masters of the guild. Like, we talked crafting in a previous class. Um, if you join a crafting guild, like the Weaponsmith Guild, for example, and you max out your reputation with the guild, you can make, with certain drops, like a symbol of the Elder King will help you craft a first age ally, or a symbol of Celebrimbor will let you craft uh, an ally of the second age. Like my weaponsmith can do that. 
Um, so those are really, really cool. So this is just the basics of LIs. This is a very complex system. Um, I could probably teach an entire lecture series on this, but I don't quite, I'll be honest, I don't quite understand the ins and outs of this um, as much as somebody like Chromite does. So definitely sit down at the feet of the masters, listen to what they have to say, and don't let them see you actually change your stuff up. <clears throat> I always feel like I'm disappointing Chromite when I do that. There's a lot of uh, barter tokens you can acquire through questing in the game that will help you. You can buy certain allies at vendors in like Bree or at skirmish camps, and they require things like r rusted dwarf tools, Kuzdul tablets, or uh, Maladrim bronze feathers, and you can buy a legendary item straight up from a vendor. So some of it, but they're still the nudging that you want to spend money doing this and I say you shouldn't have to. <clears throat> now, thing is, as I mentioned, the scrolls of empowerment are what really are the 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 meat and bones of upgrading your allies, maxing them out to their fullest potential. You don't need to do that to play the game. Uh, for many years I ignored allies because too much work. I do this for funsies. Um, <clears throat> however, I noticed that with certain classes, um, it was better to use the LI, so it was time to put some effort into it. So I've been starting to do that, but it's it's been a it's been a slog because of uh, what you have to do to get those scrolls of empowerment. Um, to answer the question in chat, do we expect an LI revamp for the end of the year? What I was told when I interviewed executive producer uh, Rob Ciccoli, Saverlin, um, at Standing Stone, is he said that they are intending on a shorter term solution of adding more sources of Scrolls of Empowerment, especially to current content, um, and later, either later this year or early next year, they were looking at a revamp of the whole system, but he really was very vague on details because they haven't decided how yet. And that's always been a thing that we've been nagging them about. I, I personally made it a mission to ask him about Oz every time I interview him because it's been going on for three years now. <clears throat> this is the third year I've interviewed him and I ask him about allies every single time because that is the frequent, that is like one of the number one frequently asked questions of our player base is when are we getting an update to allies? How are we going to get these? Because it's a grind, and people hate grinding. I mean, there's legitimate grinding. This feels like grinding out the Winter Spring Frost Saber in World of Warcraft, which took a month. <clears throat> so that's the very basics of LIs. Uh, let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Now, we had mentioned... Uh, let me see. Ah, there's the next slide. I was wondering about that. All right, next slide. I'm going to talk about the... well. Where do you where do you get these done? So you're gonna see vendors in the game called Forge and or Relic Masters. Uh, these are the vendors for legendary items. These are the ones that will help you reforge, like the Forge Master helps you reforge your legendary item. Um, they also identify the legacies of an LI, reforging it every ten levels, and they do imbuement. Relic Masters can combine the lesser relics into greater ones up to tier 10. They can destruct relics and entire allies and meld relics together. They're located in many places all over Middle-earth. Some NPCs are one-stop shopping and they're an all-in-one. So let me get my character someplace cool that I know that there's like a, a Forge Master really close. We might actually go for a quick ride through Bree. Because it's always time for a ride through Bree. <clears throat> I was actually hanging out on my personal premium house over in Belfala, so we've been listening to. I'm actually a little bit surprised that I wasn't playing the game music. All right. We're going to go to the Relic Master in uh, near the south gate of Bree. I'll let you watch with me. So we're going to show you the UI of what these people look like.
Oh, did they change the mannequins again? I forget how often they change the mannequins. That's okay. Alright. <clears throat> do, do, do. Yeah, if you have multiple characters, it is actually a lot faster to get stuff done. Simply because you get more stuff to work with these folks. And you'll see uh, this icon on the map. Uh, it's hard to tell. But here on the mini-map, it's easier to tell. It's the symbol of somebody with in front of an anvil going like this. Yeah, the easiest way right now to earn uh, Scrolls of Empowerment is to run Minas Tirith dailies, and it takes like half an hour if you're if you're good at them. So here's the Forge Master and the Relic Master. Uh, one of each. They both have the same symbol over their head. What can I do for you? So this is the initial uh, screen you'll see when you want to identify something. I don't have anything to identify. Um... One of the things is you have to unlock an item in order to identify it or destroy it. And I don't have anything to identify. Huh. But it's like the lock that you see on some of these items like right here in the lower left hand corner. You can't, you can't destroy anything without unlocking it. So it's, it's a little bit of a safety so you don't accidentally fat finger something. So you can pick what item or items you want to identify. There is a drop-down box that will let you do all of them at once. However, it also costs real money. Not, I'm sorry, let me rephrase it. Not real money, like money, like real, real life money, but it costs in-game gold. And so you want to be careful. If the, you have a legendary item, you just, you know, you want to see what it does, then you can identify it here. Once an item hits that round figure, like level 10, level 20, level whatever, it'll come up and say that you, it won't level up any further until you reforge it. So you click here. It will tell you the name of the item that's available. You can give it a name here if you want to. Um, I generally do not check refund LP because generally if I've spent my, uh, my points... And these are legend points, not to be confused with Lotro points. You're not getting any Lotro points out of this. <clears throat> I tell it not to refund all of these points that I've spent on the item. Right here. You notice, the ones that have been imbued don't have points in here because you can't spend those sorts of points, legend points, on an imbued item. And you can't reforge an imbued item. You're done You're done reforging at that point. And then, if you do the first thing, if you have multiple items ready to reforge, it'll go through them all at once. So that's that lady. And so the other person is the, uh, the Relic Master. Horn blow. And you got four tabs up the top here. A uh, first tab is where you can make your own relics out of the ones you already have. Now, um, when you acquire a relic, it goes into the wallet over here. Actually, I don't think it goes over here. I lied. I'm telling fibs, so they're not showing up over here. <clears throat> but it can tell you how many you have. So apparently I have 27 bronze settings of will in this nebulous relic. Basically, it doesn't take up space in your inventory, which is really nice. Uh, like, unlike all this other stuff I have. So I have 0 of 27 bronze settings of will that I could make. And then I combine these settings. And you can make relics up to tier 9. So drop down box up to tier 9. So it means you, if you don't have a relic for something, you can make one. And this is, again, for the setting, which is this very first purple block right here. And you can actually do a auto-combine option, where if you have a whole bunch of them, it will automatically combine and make some stuff for you. Buyer beware, 
Uh, as you notice, the cost does go up to a maximum of 100 silver, so it's not much. But generally, once you've hit level 100, you're not even going to mess with this because tier 9 is below level 100. So there's that. Alright, deconstructing is also something you can do. And again, this actually will respect whether something is locked or not. So if you click the lock, it removes it from the list because they don't have show locked in place. So if I wanted to deconstruct this captain's emblem of the third age, it's like, well, why wouldn't I want to? I'm not a captain. Um, so I'm going to deconstruct it. And then it gave me a tier one bronze setting of might because it was uh, a low level item. And you can also do a all option here and it will de deconstruct everything. So as it says, deconstructing legendary items can produce relics that can be used to improve other allies and heritage runes um, that will provide them with experience. The level and rarity of the item influences the result of the attempt. So basically, the better item you deconstruct, the more you're going to get for it. So for example, if you have an LI you want to deconstruct, max it out first and then deconstruct it. Because this is the trick of getting free legacy replacements. M level up multiple LIs, get them maxed out. But each ally, you want to focus on one specific legacy. So this great sword has uh, a legacy on it that I'm keeping an eye on. I want to have, let's say I want to get the brutal strikes damage as the main thing here. So when you deconstruct that, you're going to get a heritage rune, which are these blue runes that I was just using that levels up uh, items. Um, the, the legacy or heritage runes. What a name. And you also get legendary fragments or legendary shards. Um, you will also get a scroll, the choice of pick one of the legacies off this item. You'll get a scroll for it. This is kind of where it gets a little bit odd and why you want to make sure that the items that you're deconstructing are going to provide you a scroll of the right legacy at the right level. Because one of the problems is with leveling LIs from 50 to a, in, in the 50 to 100 range, if you deconstruct a level 50 LI, but you want to take that legacy and add it to a level 75 LI, it won't let you. The scroll will automatically be flagged to be, you know, max level of 55 or something like that. <clears throat> One of the things the system is really good about is informing you that you can't use a scroll on an item, that there's no valid items for that scroll to be used on. But sometimes it won't tell you before you click on the scroll that you're wasting your time. So it's generally goes by levels, but not always. All right. The next uh, tab is melding. This is where you can make better things. And this is where the currency called shards comes into play. And you see this little icon that kind of looks like the rupees from Legend of Zelda. So you need to have certain relics in your nebulous inventory to be able to make certain items. And they go by the tiers. One, two, three, five six, seven, and as they get better, if you hover over this item, this is a tier seven platinum setting of will. This is what it'll give you. This does nothing for it. And you see, basically, they are set for the primary stats of the game for the most part. Uh, like an adamant gem of dexterity is obviously going to be an agility thing because dexterity and agility go hand in hand. Um, <clears throat> but it's also got this critical rating. So this would be really good for like a, a burglar or a hunter class who's in those range. And some of them will actually tell you later on, like Kalinard's setting of will, uh, the tier eight stuff tells us 
that that is something in the Rise of Isengard expansion because you can mine Kalinard Skarn there. <clears throat> and then Tier 9 is going to be your proper Rohan stuff with the Rittermark stuff. Aerolingus Tier 10 is going to be your late Rohan, early Gondor content. And there's no Tier 11 or higher. There's some unique stuff. Um, it's a unique gem of charity. But as you can see, it's got a level cap. It requires a minimum level 55 and requires a level 55 item. And they have the items, you know, the levels listed right there. And they only go up to, they even tell you, like Westfold, Great River, East Emnet. That corresponds with the crafting tiers and the zones in those areas. So East Emnet uh, is your early Rohan content, Wildermore, and then West Emnet is your old Rohan content. Then you have your legendary support. This is the other place where you can make scrolls of empowerment and whatnot. And look, it takes almost 1,900 shards. I've only got 400. <coughs> and scrolls and, you know, the scrolls of delving, the scrolls of renewal, which helps you reset your legend points if you misclicked on something. Um... These all are based on levels as well. So you want to be careful which scroll you're actually crafting if you decide to use the melding option to make a scroll of empowerment, as you notice. Maximum target level is 65. So this scroll of empowerment, I can only use it on something going up to level 65. There's also some legacies that you can craft. These are like legacies of lesser vitality, you know, agility. And these can be okay, but for the most part, you're not going to waste a legacy on a main stat. For the most part, you're going to use your legacy spots for things like improving your skills. And then you can also uh, make unidentified allies, like a champion's rune of the third age of varying levels. The highest one here for almost 5,700 shards is 95. So the system really, this stuff, this relic reforging is mainly for lower level stuff. You can make light bridles. The highest level one is again level 95. So, so there's basic mounted, and this is where you can also craft your mounted uh, combat. Like your, your war steed, let's go back here. Oh, wrong thing. Your Warsteed Bridle also has relics you can add to it. And as you can tell, I haven't bothered. Then again, my Warsteed Bridle is level 99. And I haven't bothered getting a new one yet. I think I sent all the ones I picked up to an alt last time I streamed. It was pretty sad. And again, they only go certain to a certain level. West Emnet. And that is melding. I generally don't do a lot with this because... It requires shards and actually requires a lot of shards. So you have to do a lot of work to get shards. You can buy some stuff in the Lotro store, but again, that's up to you if you want to play with the cash shop for buy for convenience sake. You can also refine uh, settings here. And this is where you can earn shards by taking things and refining. And you can decide how many either in these round figures or just choose to refine the entire stack and then you know let's say we do the stack it's going to give me 26 shards so it's one shard per refinement and they also you know get and that's one way to earn shards but again unless you have a lot of these runes floating around you're not going to get a lot out of it so <clears throat> it's not really the most efficient uh way spending of your time so let's go see what's next on our agenda. All right. So we're going to move away from allies and into essences, though, from my understanding, a knowledge of how essences work may very well factor into allies 3.0. We don't know yet. We'll find out soon. But our next thing we're going to talk about is essences. Uh, there are two aspects of the essence system. They are slotted gear 
that you need to put an essence into, and then the actual essences. Uh, essences and slotted gear drop as early as level 50, but do not become common until approximately level 100. Quite frankly, in my opinion, I wouldn't mess with essences or essence gear until you get to Gondor. There's no point in it. However, if you're playing through content in the Gondor areas, you'll wind up getting essences out the... Well, coming out your ears. Essences have tiers, just like regular gear, with yellow, purple, cyan, and gold backgrounds on the icons of the nameplates. Um, they do have minimum levels of, you know, how low can you go to play Limbo to, to equip that essence. And some of them uh, won't equip because you're over level for it. Essences can boost any particular primary or secondary stat with more options on higher quality essences. For example, a gold essence top of the line may have like your primary stat like might and then also have like a morale regen on top of that or something like that. Um, <clears throat> they can be crafted by most vocations uh, at higher tiers of crafting. It, it requires the acquisition of something called a universal solvent. A very few quests, a rare drop uh, Hobbit presence and the Lotra store. You can buy as many as you want in the Lotra store. They don't care. Uh, you can also uh, craft them through uh, certain options in crafting, but it does have a cooldown. So the whole idea of essences in that regard of crafting them is intended to be a time slash money sink. Essences can be removed through the use of the socket control panel in the character pane or an essence removal scroll. Uh, let me pop up my character here. I'll pop up the game for just a second. This is your socket control. So you drag and drop socketed equipment here to slot, unslot, or replace an existing essence. Do I have any slotted essence gear right now? The answer is probably no. Not at this time, because they actually have moved a little bit away from uh, essence gear. So, oh, here we go. Let me hit H. By default, if you have an item highlighted in the game and you hit H, it will pin that item so you can move it around. So this is an item of, of essence item. So it's got this empty slot. Items can come, I think, up to three. Might be four empty slots. Most just have one or two. And then you can socket a an essence in there. Do I have an essence on this character? I don't think I do. Oh, here's one right here. Let's pin this item. So this is a flickering moonlit essence of physical mitigation. <clears throat> it tells me my item level. It tells me what it will do for me and how low can I go to be able to use this item. And this is a standard yellow item. Nothing fancy here. So if I wanted to add physical mitigation to this particular item, I would slot this uh, thing. And that actually might be a good idea because I'm on a champion. So the way you equip an essence is you click here. And it will give me two options of items this essence will fit into. And again, it's based on level um, more than anything else. The level of the item and the level of the essence. So I can put it in either one of these. So I can either put it into my neck piece, my torque. Or into my pocket item. Hmm. I'm actually less, more likely to switch out the the necklace. Um, the resistance rating is nice, but uh, I'm going to be keeping that emblem of valor much longer. I think so. I'm going to put the uh, the essence right there. And we refresh this real quick. Now you can see that it has the essence slotted, and then it tells me what it's adding to my other stats. <coughs> Essences are really an end game sort of feature. You, as you saw, I was running around without an essence slotted in all because I didn't really care. Um, it didn't really need, I didn't really need it for what I was doing because I mainly casually play on the landscape. 
Now, if I was in a raid situation, then that would definitely be a case where I'd want to pay attention to my essences and make sure I got the exact right ones for my class, for my spec, for my role in the raid. But for casual landscape, you don't have to push it all that much. Hey, look, I got a legacy tier upgrade thing. Nice. All right. So that's the overview of essences. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, wrong way. Oh, we're at the end of our class. <coughs> it's not even six o'clock yet. So that's pretty good. <clears throat> so we've gone over a lot of stuff. Um, again, Standing Stone owned sites. Those are official uh, locations. I will caution that some of the stuff on the forums, uh, unless the name that is posting is blue, that person does not speak for Standing Stone and their opinion matters only as much as you believe them. <coughs> Anybody who's blue, they work for Standing Stone on the forums. And uh, they are the voice from the heavens. Oh. So definitely they are the voice of the company and what they say is official. Uh, also, if you have any questions, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things you can answer by reading the help files on help.standingstonegames.com. And that's also where you are going to put in bug reports or if you have a problem with your game or you're having a problem with your account and need to recover it, for example. <clears throat> if you just want to talk to fellow players in a setting where that is actively curated to be um, not grumpy, not always official. Um, one thing about twitch.tv slash stream is the only time that anything anybody says there is official is when Cordova and our community manager is on Thursdays, Fridays, Fridays uh, from noon to 1 p.m., and he is our community manager. He works for Standing Stone. And he does answer a lot of questions in an official capacity. However, if you just have questions about gameplay, um, first of all, don't ask Gordon. <laughs> I, I like to tease him, but you're better off asking longtime players. Not necessarily me. I, I'm good for teaching the, the stuff like this, the, the newbie stuff. But... One of the things we do on Lotion Stream is we want to make sure that if a new player comes into the channel and asks a legitimate I need help question, um, what what stat should I focus on for my class or which piece of gear should I look for or you know something like that with all this itemization and how to understand all this stuff, you can ask a question just about any one of our streamers and either they or somebody in the community who's in chat will give you, in most cases, a legitimate, honest, helpful answer. Because when folks don't do that in the official Lojo channel, the moderators will deal with it. And I'm one of the moderators, so. But for the most part, those of us who, you know, try to keep people to behave themselves, um, <clears throat> we don't do a lot of banning unless people are being really bad. But for the most part, we do try to cultivate a welcoming environment because you know, everybody was new once upon a time, um, and even those of us who have been in the game since it opened um, can still stand to learn something. So uh, rely on your fellow community, and most of them will, if you ask them uh, a newbie question, they'll be happy to answer in a legitimate and helpful manner. So that's one of the cool things. However, if you need more assistance, uh, my good friend Fibro Jedi has uh, lots of Lotro Beginners guides. Uh, and our best wishes go out to him right now because he's currently in hospital uh, dealing with some shenanigans not related to the current global shenanigans but something else so we wish him the best and swiftest of recoveries because he, he has really poured so much of himself into his guides and being part of this community that you know a nicer person on this planet doesn't exist However, you also can go to LotroWiki.com for additional guides. Uh, also, a lot of information, a lot of uh, that I pulled in for the slides here for the show come from the wiki. Uh, but they are definitely more in-depth than I could ever be. And they could also be more confusing, especially to new players who don't play video games on the regular. So if you have any questions um, that the wiki has thrown you for a loop, you're not sure, um, drop me a line in Discord on the Signum U Discord. 
Um, you can also just drop me a PM if you don't want to, you know, set it out there openly. It's like, you know, there's, there's some folks who are trying to like, I don't want to ask my question in public. You can do that. And if I don't know the answer, I will try to find it for you because, you know, that's what I try to do. Or unless I can point you in the right direction. Like, if you want to know all the in-depths about LIs, please talk to Chromite because he knows all about it. I, don't, I know I know the basics. I know enough to be dangerous. That's about it. So we'll see you again tomorrow from um, starting at 4, as always. Give you a quick preview of what we're doing tomorrow. And even more, Lumbus. We're going to go into some more systems, including bags and storage and all the sorts of fun things. So it's going to be a little bit more casual a lot less numbers. Um, we're still going to be in game for a little bit to show you all the cool stuff. Um, so definitely tune in tomorrow if you're here and if you're watching asynchronously. Thank you. Um, this will be up on my personal YouTube channel later tonight. Uh, whenever YouTube gets done processing the video. Uh, it will also be part of a special collection here on the Signum U Twitch channel. And later tonight on the Signum U Twitch channel, it'll be episode... Two? Yeah, episode two. Why? No, oh, that's that's the next. I was like, why the date on that's wrong? Uh, so episode two of the Morgoth's Ring uh, book. Professor Corey will be teaching the last book of the history of Middle Earth. And it's really exciting. So that'll be sometime after 10 o'clock. So keep your ear to the ground. Go out, get you some snacks. Play some games. Play with your cat. This is the first class thief kitty hasn't interrupted for stream of mine entirely that he hasn't interrupted in. I can't remember the last time. So I'll wait for you instead of thief kitty and we will be back tomorrow. Uh, there will not be class on Friday because I will be streaming on the official Lotro channel on Friday. Feel free to come on over. Uh, I'll be on Lotro stream uh, causing chaos and hopefully not streaming until nine o'clock like last time. Because the story was so good, but oh my god, I was so hungry when it was done. So I will see you next time, and you know the usual, if you can't be good, be good at it. And uh, have a good night.